Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pastor Mel, Pastor Jacob. It's such an honor and a privilege to be able to share the word uh, this morning. And it's such a beautiful church here and just poised for what God is about to do. I'm so excited for this next chapter, this next season for you. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I'll just share uh, what I felt in prayer over your church as well. But I uh, thank you so much for the honor and thank you everyone for the honor of being able to preach uh, the word to you. Uh, and also online as well. Great to connect with you today. Uh, my senior pastors, uh, Pastor Joel and Pastor Sharon, they love you. They're praying for you and pass on their heart and love to you today. And also uh, my wife and my kids. Uh, my wife is currently preaching in the southeast of Perth. And for me, we've come to the northwest. So we have separated far today. I promise our marriage is in good shape, but we've gone far and wide. <laughs> And uh, these are my two boys. We've got Judah, and uh, who's just turned 13, and Ben, who's finishing his last year of primary school, and then we've officially got two high schoolers, which is a bit of a crazy thought for us. Uh, you know, I, I love uh, this area. I love the north of the river. It is a trek. It is a trek. I'm a Southie. And I grant you that you've got the best beaches, all right? Yeah. I give you that. you got the beaches. I concede. I concede defeat in there. However... How long have I got? <laughs> We've got the best river views. You can't, you can't compete with that. But the, I've got the beaches. You've got the beaches. So stay with me. Stay with me. Uh, you got the, uh, we've got the amazing uh, Swan River and just leading up and that beautiful view from South Perth over the city. And, you know, growing up, we had a little boat and we, uh, my dad would take my sister and myself out, sometimes into Coburn Sound. We went across to Rottnest once, but most of the time we were in the river and my dad had uh, a real love for fishing and uh, like to do crabbing and I remember this time that he really got into going for prawns in the Swan River and as I was praying for everyday church I really felt God bring me back to that moment I hadn't thought about this for years uh, this moment but God brought me back to this moment where we were out at night and we were on the Swan River when there was a fast current going through and we would have this sort of five six meter uh, motorboat and we would be making our way against the, the current, against the tide, had this huge spotlight on either side of the boat, and one person would hold the spotlight, and the other person would have a net, and we'd be looking for these prawns as they came through the current uh, going through the river, and then we would reach out and we'd catch the prawns and bring them into the boat. And I just felt that God was saying something to your church in this time around that picture. You are a church that is uh, significant. It is absolutely a spotlight or a lighthouse church. And we know Jesus' words about being a city on a hill. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And that absolutely is in the DNA of this church, this spotlight going out. And I really sense that this next season that God is uh, causing the catch to come in, that uh, people will be caught in the net and brought onto the boat. And the metaphor changes, which is a good thing because we turn those prawns into some beautiful garlic and chili dishes and I'm still celebrating today. But the metaphor changes when they get on the boat and actually saw these people coming onto the boat, coming on board out of the darkness into the place of stability, into the place of strength, into the place of safety, being rescued. And they were dripping wet, their clothes were, uh, were saturated and torn, and then the church coming around and putting fresh clothes upon them, drying them off, equipping them, uh, making them whole and healed and full of dignity and strength. And this is a house of dignity. It's a house of dignity, bringing dignity and hope and life transformation to people. And then they became part of the spotter team and part of catching uh, the harvest that God was bringing in. But I really felt a couple of things in that, that if I could just share before I get into the Word. I do feel that this next chapter and season for your church is one of significance. And you've had to go against the tide. you had to go against the flow. And to go against the flow requires resource and energy. And it's so much easier just to go with the slipstream, just to follow everything else and just to follow uh, what's easy. But you've chosen the hard path. And church, you've chosen the hard path. And it's the path of Christ. It's the path of faith. And it's the prophetic promises of God. And the promise of God is that as you have chosen to direct yourself against the tide, against the flow of the easy, that God will cause a great harvest to come. 
He's bringing people amongst your path that would otherwise be an unreached people group. There will be stories of transformation. I see people in our movement. I see pastors and leaders of the future that are currently lost and broken today. And it's because of the decisions of this church to go where no one else would go, to go against the tide, to be willing to put the spotlight out, to be willing to catch the harvest, to be willing to clean and to restore and add dignity to people. This is a house of of restoration. This is a house of salvation. This is a house of dignity. And God is in it. And I just see favor and favor upon this next stage. So come on, let's just take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for this church, that this is a landmark church in the city of Perth. And Lord, that many, many, many souls will be changed one at a time. Transformation will be upon this house. Dignity will be upon this house. I pray supernatural favor and provision, wisdom and strength into every plan and purpose of God. We pray that the plans of the enemy would be brought to nil. No weapon formed against this church will prosper because the plans for this church are far greater than what you could ask, think, dream, or even imagine. Lord, we release your favor. We release the promises of God and we declare this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm really excited to bring a word today and I feel that this word that I'm bringing is not a corrective word. It's not even a word that is new to this house, but I really feel that this word is like God wanting to solidify something that already exists in the DNA of your church. It's like, uh, and, and I've got a Danish father, so uh, Lego, the homeland of Lego, is in Denmark. I've been to Legoland over there. I overpromised my kids when I took them over there to meet all the family that we're going to go to Legoland in Denmark. They thought the entire country was made out of Lego, so... We had to shove a pastry in them and say, look, just be satisfied with that. We'll get to Legoland eventually. But I love to help my kids with Lego, also take over their projects. And come on, all good fathers know this is the truth, and plenty of good mothers too. But sometimes they build the Lego and all the pieces are in the right place, and, but they just, they just need to be pushed in. There's nothing wrong. They're all positioned well. They just need to be pushed in. And that's what I feel God wants to do today. He just wants to push in and solidify and strengthen some of the things that are already in the core, already in the DNA. And I'm going to be talking to you about the image of God, the image of God. And so we are going to start actually uh, with a passage that many of us had on our hearts 70 days ago, which was the end of 2023 coming into 2024 and we all had the same moment as we counted down to the new year. Some of us did that at 11.59 and some of us did that at 8.59 and decided we're just going to celebrate with Sydney and go to bed early. But all of us at some point did a little bit of a countdown in our head and we go into those final 10 seconds of the year. 10, 9, 8 and then you get to 8 and you think, oh my goodness, I haven't set my New Year's resolutions. What am I going to do? What are my goals going to be? I start to go through those things. You know, is it going to be financial? Financial things, and we're going to travel. Is it a relationship thing? Uh, seven, six, five. Oh, that's it. Uh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What do we put in? Four, three, two. Weight loss. Everyone does weight loss. That's a safe one. Let's do weight loss. One, zero. Happy New Year. Our New Year's resolution is set. I'm uh, on to my sixth weight loss goal for the year. <laughs> Just reset the the bar a little bit higher, (laughs) which is actually lower. But anyways, that's a message for another day and personal issues that I will deal with separate to the congregation today. But we get to that point where we set our own goals for the year. And I thought, you know, there is something good about that and, and, and all of that. But sometimes we actually set our own dreams and our own goals for the year. And we take passages like Jeremiah 29, 11, and we just give it a little tweak. I mean, Jeremiah did a fairly good job with that, but we just help him out a little bit. For I know the plans I have for me, I declare to the Lord. Plans to prosper me, plans to give me a wonderful hope and a future. And Lord, I pray that you would fulfill the plans that I have set for myself. I've got this under control. And we find ourselves echoing the words of the people of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, where we say, let us make a name for ourselves. And we puff ourselves up with our dreams and our visions, and we create an image of God. So today I'm going to teach you how to make your very own image 
image of God. Now, I want you to hold with me. I promise we'll get back to true biblical teaching. So please don't shut me off. I can already see they've cut off online. So come back, come back. Uh, So how do you make an image of God? Well, let's start with the first thing. Do what makes you happy. That's a great message for this generation, isn't it? For our time. Do what makes you happy because life really is about you and your happiness. That's the ultimate goal of life. So if you're not doing something happy, then just get out of that because hard work and resilience isn't really something that we need to worry about in this generation. It's all about your personal happiness. Number two. Let's bring that up there. Use your own ability to fix the broken areas of your life. Or even better, just pretend that you don't have any broken areas of your life and live in denial. And, and if anyone else has a problem with you, it's their issue, not yours. And so, but if you do notice that there are some things that are, aren't, aren't working, please don't go to Jesus. Don't get help. Just fix them in and of yourself. Please no one quote me at this level and put it on social media. I will lose my job. Third one, find truths that you're comfortable with. Heaven forbid if we actually get challenged by the Word of God or offended by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's definitely not for this time and this place. So just find truths that make you comfortable, but don't worry, you're not alone in that because social media is a beautiful gift to you and me because it will reinforce the beliefs and the values that you already have. And so don't even worry about that one. They will help to reinforce your very own beliefs. Don't be challenged with everything. This is how you make your own God. And then number four Make them virtuous. Put virtue and value behind them. I am just putting self-care in my life. And actually, I, I am someone of significance and worth, and I don't deserve to be challenged with inconvenient things like truth and common sense. And so we create these images of God. And look, we all know the people that influencers on social media for that we can quickly throw the first stone at. But really, all of us, I'm sure, in some area of our life can identify with this, uh, at least on some level. And you might think that you're alone if you go, oh my goodness, I'm feeling a little bit guilty, a little bit challenged here. But actually, the human heart is the same through all of history. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 44, because in that passage of Scripture, we also find a people that were making a name for themselves. Let's have a read. Who shapes an, uh, a God and casts an idol which can profit nothing? I'm just tripping over the cord here. There we go. He also fashions a God and worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. They didn't even need social media. Uh, let's go to the next one. They know nothing. These idols, they understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over. They cannot see. Their minds are closed, so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. Does this sound like a current generation thing? Well, actually, it's not a current generation thing. It's a human heart thing from the Old Testament all the way up to us here and now today. Let's continue this depressing journey. (laughs) Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads them. He cannot save himself or say, is this thing in my right hand a lie. Is not this thing in my right hand a lie? We have a culture, a generation that does not know truth from lie. And so rather than confront the lack of understanding of truth, we just buy into the lie. And then God comes and he confronts us a little bit more. Uh, Just the next one there. Thank you. Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you. You are my servant Israel and I will not forget. God says, you are not to fashion an image of God. You're not to create a belief system. You're not to create a worldview out of your own understanding and experience and education and disappointments and comforts. We have to realize that we're not to make our own God. But God is the one that makes us. And the people of that time in exile would have heard that and immediately their minds would have gone to another passage of Scripture. And that is the very first chapter of our Bible today. Genesis chapter 1, where God creates us in His image, in the image and the likeness of God, male and female. He created them. He created us, absolutely. And so I want to talk to us about what does it mean to be made in the image of God. Now, this is a confronting thing for our generation because we are used to and we are conditioned to saying what is new is better than what is 
old. AI technology is better than just a Google search engine. And we've seen the advancement of technology and many good things that have come with that. But what it has also done is it's inflamed our sense of superiority over previous generations. And in doing so, we tend to dismiss things of the past as primitive and we embrace things of the new as superior. And so, in my home, I live in Leeming. That's a southern suburb. Suburb, I don't expect you to have any context of where it is. Don't worry. But my house was built 44 years ago. And there is this pillar in the middle of, middle of my house that it sort of blocks the view of everything. And so, I thought, I want to get rid of that pillar and really make it an open plan. Now, there, it's not as bad as you think. Hold, my, hold the thoughts. I, don't, I do know my limitations when it comes to renovations. And so I called someone out, uh, a professional builder, and I said, look, I want to get this pillar out. And uh, these are my plans. And I started to tell them, and I gave them great vivid detail of the beautiful plans that I had down to the color scheme and the idea and the concept. You know, I want to go back to my roots. I want it to be like a Scandinavian design and just really modern and fresh. Do you know what? They weren't interested in any of that. All they asked for was my, my old plants. And I said, my old plans, don't you want to know about my new plans? Don't you want to know about the house that I want to build, the image I want to make? He said, I want the old plans. And so I delve into my study and I pull them out. And it's a little bit embarrassing what I've got to show them. I don't think I can preach this message with this plan again. I think this is literally on its last legs. And so I pull out the plans and you know what they said? I thought they were going to say, oh, that's rubbish, that's useless. They said, perfect. That's the original plans. That's going to show us whether it's a load-building pillar. They came back with a quote, and I decided that I love that pillar now. <laughs> it's a real feature of the house, and it gives character and life to it. I was an accountant in my former life, and I haven't quite been able to get the accounting out of the blood. And so, you laugh... But we also have an original book, don't we? That tells us about our original design. And when it comes to understanding what it is to be made in the image of God, this Bible, this Word is what tells us what is true and what is false. What is a part of the original design? What is load-bearing? And what is just decoration that has actually come to cloud and to distort the true image of who you and I are created in the likeness and the image of God as male or female. To understand that, we actually need to delve into the good book. So, I want to talk to us today about five implications of being made like God, being made in His image, being made in His likeness. Are you ready to delve with me? And we're not going to look at the latest trends on social media. I haven't done a chat GPT for this message. No, I haven't. I really haven't. It's all come from the Word of God and the truth of God. So let's delve in five things. First thing is that God is the source of truth and life. God is the source of truth and life. Not our education, not our disappointments, not our experiences, not our family background, not the beliefs that we grew up with, not the personality that we have both been given and that we have developed and adapted to in life. We are not any of those things at our core, they can help to draw out, they can help to amplify. Sometimes they even work against us to distort and to shift and change our self-perception. But ultimately, God is the source of truth and life. I love that we sang that song, Firm Foundation. And what a beautiful uh, worship experience that the team led us in. Thank you so much. You know, this revelation that God absolutely is the foundation of our lives. By choosing to make Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, by adopting Him as the foundation and the central point of our life that we make every decision based on Him, we are actually setting ourselves up to be the image bearers of Christ. We are made in the image of God. This is why worship is so important. 
Because worship takes us off from ourselves. It takes us away from our lives. It takes us away from thinking about our work, our family, our problems, our dreams, our plans. And it centers us on God. We worship Him. We abandon ourselves to Him. We exalt Him. God, our soul magnifies You. We worship You. We declare that You are Savior of the world. We declare, hallelujah, that You are worthy to be praised. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You're the beginning and the end. Nothing is impossible for you. We lift up our eyes. We lift up our focus. And in doing so, we actually discover who we are because we cannot be discovered apart from in Him. I mean, what were the words that the Father spoke to Jesus on the day of His baptism? In the book of Luke, He is very intentional. He says, You are my Son, whom I love, in whom I am well pleased. It's in the context of who the Father is that we find out who we are. And it's a bit of a slap in the face to a culture that says that we don't need God. I mean, I know I'm not speaking to those that are in the room so much today, but we have a culture that's growing up believing that they've evolved from nothing and are going to nothing. I did a funeral on Friday for a lady that had no faith and no Christian background. And I was instructed, I was asked, if I would serve the family in that way by doing the funeral. But they said, please don't talk about anything religious. Don't pray, no Bible. I'm like, well, that's all I've kind of got. But, um, and, you know, I, I served the family and, and, and wanted to bless them, be there in their time of grief because, you know, Jesus did say, uh, blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted, not just blessed are the Christians who mourn, but God has a heart for every person and so it's a privilege. But I tell you, there's something missing it wasn't hope-filled. It wasn't life-giving. Why? Because God is the source of life and truth. You see the foundation of your life. And if not, it's not about working hard for it. It's just about coming back to Him. It's about repentance. Repentance isn't a dirty word. Repentance isn't a bad word. Repentance is a change of mind. I was walking this way, and I changed my mind, and I walked the other way. It's as simple and powerful and profound as that. First implication, God is the source of life and truth. Second implication is that our identity is fixed and not fluid. God created us in His image, male and female, He created them. I'm the guest preacher. I get to preach today, be controversial and then leave. And then this team at the front, they have to fix up all of the mess. So I don't preach this sort of message in my home church because then I have to do all the hard work. So let me preach it. What I wanted, I do preach this to my home church. I just want to clarify there was in 2022 a news article in the Melbourne newspaper, The Age, about an eight-year-old girl in primary school who identified as a cat. And the education system uh, said, do you know what? The Word of God actually doesn't say that you're a cat, that you are a child of God. You're made in the image of God and, and you need some support. We're going to provide some support and we're going to give you some great counseling and we're going to get you involved in a great church and kids ministry. Unfortunately, the education system of Victoria didn't go down that path and they decided that they were going to reinforce the belief system of this child that fully in believed that she was a cat. They provided a litter box in the back of the class. They accommodated her as though she, the delusion that she had was reality. I grew up in a home with a mother that uh, was schizophrenic. And I always, whenever I tell the story, I forget to tell the ending. My mum gave her heart to Jesus. Uh, she is doing so well. She hasn't been in a psych ward for about eight years, which is an absolute miracle. I say that because that is the miracle, because when I was a teenager and she literally lost her mind in the, uh, in, in the school day, the mum that I left before school was a different person to who I came home to that afternoon. Her delusions, her fears, her paranoia was so extreme that people were speaking to her. Messages were coming to her through shows like Everybody Loves Raymond and The Simpsons and, and the red cars on the road meant that people were out to get her and all of these irrational signs. And we have the choice to make in life whether we help to reinforce delusions or we actually come to truth. And the truth is that our identity is fixed and it's not fluid. Not you might be my son or daughter Jesus, whoever you identify with, whom I love and I'm well, well pleased with. It was you are my son, whom I love, in whom I'm well pleased. It was this concrete statement. And I don't say this to say that we should be out there fighting and 
judging people and all of that, that. And I'll come to that in the next point. My point is that we need to be sure and secure in our identity. And, you know, as a follower of Jesus, there are times that I question, does God really love me? Does God really forgive me? Does God really have a plan and a purpose for my life? Am I really a son of God? Does he really accept me? But with those questions, it's so important that we actually come to him because he will take the question mark and he will straighten it up and make an exclamation mark. Yes, I love you. Yes, I have forgiven you. Yes, it is by grace and not by works. Yes, I have a plan for your life. Let those things be firm and secure in your life and mine. The third implication of being made in the image of God is simply this, that every person has dignity. Now, if you are next to someone that you love, it's so easy to look at them and say, you have dignity and I see the image of God within you. If, like you very often with my wife on a stressful Sunday morning as we're trying to get the kids ready for church and plan all of the last minute things and there are passionate discussions on the way to church that is less about faith and the fruit of the Spirit and more about um, how we're going to bring our self-control into alignment, uh, it can be a little bit harder to see the image of God in the other person. And, and look, maybe I'm the only person that struggles with this, but let me declare that there are times that I find it hard to see the image of God in other people. But in every single human being, there is the capacity to see and to perceive the image of God. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus speaks about these two groups of people and he identifies one group of people that went and saw people that were imprisoned, people that were naked, people that were homeless, people that were ashamed, people that were at their lowest point. And they came and they gave dignity and they gave help and they gave support and they gave strength. And Jesus' comment to them was when you did it for one of these, the least of these, you did it for me. In other words, the image of God was released in that moment and was recognized. My grandfather, I uh, mentioned the Danish heritage, my grandfather uh, was actually arrested in World War II and he spent time in a Danish prison and then was uh, transported to a German concentration camp. Now, he survived the war. Uh, he was blonde hair, blue white, and so according to the Nazis, that was the ideal. And so purely because of his race, he was treated better. But the people that were in that camp also consisted of Jews and Russians uh, and others, political prisoners as well, who were treated with the absolute worst of the worst. They were dehumanized. The idea that we were made in the image of God was so foreign to those Nazi guards and the Nazi occupation by and large as people were dehumanized. Can I tell you our job as followers and image bearers of Jesus Christ is to do the exact opposite is to find every single person and to declare over them that they are loved by God. They are image bearers of God. It's your job and it's mine to actually instill dignity into the hearts of this generation. What would we say to the parents, the teachers, and to this child that I mentioned when they've accommodated this little girl, eight-year-old girl, and treated her as a cat? Like, you know, I would, I would want to bring some truth into that situation, but could I sit before the teachers that made that decision and still give them honor and dignity. I was personally challenged by this because uh, where my wife and I are based, we are at Centerpoint Church in Maddington. Maddington's a very low socioeconomic area and there's lots of uh, challenges and problems that are right before you. And there was a gentleman that came and set up residence in our car park. Now this was a brand new car park that we'd opened up and it had taken budget blowouts and council applications. It was a stressful time in my life. And so I was so excited when we opened this car park and within a matter of a couple of weeks, a gentleman had also appreciated the gift that we had provided and set up his, his bed there and everything. And I was wrestling with what does it mean to be a Christian and to see the image of God in this situation. I went over to this gentleman and genuinely to ask how he was going and uh, he was must have been in his 60s. He had bottles of uh, all sorts of alcoholic beverages that were in his car and the smell and the stench. And I looked at all of those bottles and I looked at this man and I thought to myself, if I collect all those bottles, you get 10 cents back. <laughs> and Lord, is that stewardship? 
No, I didn't, I didn't. Um, I, that was the second thought. But the first thought was, <laughs> what do I see when I see this man? Do I see him in his current condition? Do I see him as someone that's an inconvenience? I spoke to him, he wasn't able to walk, he had a bad leg injury. He wasn't able to drive his car because he was highly intoxicated and also had no petrol left in the car. And so I invited him to come into my car and I drove him across to Mission Australia, which is right near us, to provide some support. But I wrestled with that because he stank and I knew that if I invited him into the car, I'm just being honest and being real, I knew my car was going to smell for a long time. It's just a little Toyota Yaris and I tell you that, that will retain that smell for some time. And I wrestled with that. I'm like, is there anything else I can do that's more convenient for me? But I really felt that this was an, uh, basically the angel that God sent to me to say, will you provide hospitality? Will you provide love? Will you see dignity? Do I see God in this man? And he was respectful. And I, and, I, and I did all of those things. And that's not a credit to myself because I had all of these things that were going on inside. But it's the challenge to us, isn't it? What about the people that are different from you? What about the people, what about your boss that's arrogant? What about that person in your workplace that's driving you crazy? What about that, the black sheep of the family that just causes such pain and division? Can you see the image of God or all you see is the problem and the pain? Being made in the image of God and being an image bearer of God means that we're actually called to love and give dignity to those that don't on the surface seem to earn it or command it, but we're called to give it anyway. God's our source. Our identity is fixed, not fluid. Every person has dignity. Fourth thing is that we are made on purpose for purpose. I think I changed my point. We're created for purpose, but I made it a little bit more poetic. On purpose for purpose. God has intentionally, God has intentionally created you with a purpose and a plan. That Jeremiah 29, 11 verse, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in a future. God has plans individually and corporately for every single person. And you might be wrestling, what is my purpose? What is my plan? Well, it comes from knowing your identity in God. One of the things that I struggle with personally is this whole thing about performance and the fear of failure and the fear of letting people down. And it it drives me sometimes and it drives me to go above and beyond sometimes, not so much out of devotion and worship, but to make a name for myself, to make myself look good. But, you know, when I actually come back to the truth that God loves me, God's grace is sufficient for me. It's not by might, it's not by power. It's by His Spirit. Yeah. It's by His grace. It's by His anointing. Yeah. Suddenly, I'm able to rest and find freedom and from that place, not trying to perform for my salvation, but simply outworking a life from the salvation and the grace of God, freedom comes and life comes. What about you? What are the areas that you're striving in today? What are the areas that you're seeking to perform in? Can I encourage you being made in the image of God means we first come to Him and then we find that everything flows out from that. I am the vine, you are the branches, Jesus said. Uh, you can't do anything without me. As the worship team come and join me and we prepare to come to a, a point of landing here and I want to bring this all together with the final point and it's simply this. It all points to Jesus. It all points to Jesus. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? You know, we wrestle because we look at ourselves and we look at our deficiencies and our flaws. But actually, Jesus is the one that we're to look for. And so I've got a series of scriptures that we're going to rapid fire go through. Are you ready to, to run through these with me? Let's have a look. First one here. It starts with this, Eve in the garden. And the promise that Satan throws at her is you will be like God, knowing good and evil. She takes the fruit. Adam takes the fruit. They both fall. They both slip up. They both fall down. And then we have from that point on, it pointing to Jesus. Jesus, the Son, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Next one. Anyone who has seen me, who has seen Jesus has seen the Father, the very image of who God is. The Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. Next one. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The Gospel displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. 
We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, called according to His purpose. We quote that one so much, don't we? For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. As we are conformed to be like Jesus, and Jesus is the exact representation of the Father, we are brought into a place of life and restoration. And I believe there's one more to go. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory or the image of God. And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands here, but I bet online or in the room today, if I were to say, has there been a time in your life where you know that you have missed the mark, where you have fallen short, where you have sinned? To sin is literally to stand in front of the AFL goals and to play like a West Coast Eagles player right now. I am a West Coast fan. I am just very disappointed in their performance over the last year, but we do have 2018 win over Collingwood. That was a highlight. To stand in front of that goal and to kick the ball out of bounds. It was supposed to reach the goal, but it missed the mark. We were supposed to be fully present, fully perfect, image bearers, the exact representation of God. And every single one of us has stood before that goal and kicked the ball and it has gone out of bounds. Every person has sinned. Every person has fallen short. It may have been earlier time in your life, but for really, we can all recognize the pattern of sin that still affects us today, even as we are on the process and journey to becoming more like Christ. And so if you hear passages like this and you feel condemnation, in any way. Well, we're all in the same boat and Jesus' word for us is that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God and that is why this whole thing points to Jesus. And this is the message of the cross. This is the gospel message and why it's powerful. Jesus saw us in our sin. He saw us in our broken, fallen state and knew that we are to blame. Everyone is guilty as charged. But rather than leaving us, He came as a doctor to look after the sick. He paid the price on the cross, dying in your place and mine, so that every single person would have the opportunity to know Jesus Christ. I'm not just preaching from the book today. I'm preaching a message that God has written into my story. I was 14 years old. My mum had been schizophrenic for 12 months before that. Our world was chaotic. Everything at home was anything but a firm foundation. I found as mum was in and out of psychiatric wards, as my father was struggled to hold the family together and did what he had learnt from his parents who had been war-torn and scarred and withdrew in times of crisis. I was looking for hope. I was looking for answers. I was aware of despair. I was aware of brokenness. I was aware of instability. And I was also aware of my own flaws. And I was searching and seeking. And it was my neighbors who invited me to church. They said, Pete, do you want to come to church? And do you know what I said to them? No. (laughs) Not interested. It's not my thing. And so they gave up at that point. No. (laughs) Every week. Pete, you should come to church. I think you're going to love church. For 10 months, they asked me, do you want to come to church? Do you want to come to church? Do you want to come to church? They even invited me at the end of 1999, which anyone that was older than 30 would know that that was when the world was supposed to end and Y2K was going to infect the world. And for those that are under 30, I apologize. I'll explain the reference afterwards. We just don't have time right now. But I was brought to a movie by my neighbors It was End of Days with Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of the worst movies. It never won an Oscar, but it did get my attention because the Antichrist was going to come back on the 31st of December. And at the opportune time, they said, now, Pete, do you want to come to church? And I said, yes, I do. Unfortunately, the next Sunday was the 2nd of January. The world would have ended, but I did come to church on the 2nd of January of the year 2000. That night, they led me in a prayer to Christ. I had an encounter with Jesus that transformed my life. I woke up with this fire in our uh a park that was behind us. We were told by the police and by fireys that we had to evacuate, put a few things away. I wasn't sure if my mom was delusional. I went outside to have a look at this fire and it was an incredibly 
well, it was never going to burn our house down, but it burnt something in me. I felt wave after wave of God's presence, wave after wave of God's power. God started to speak to me about how He had a plan for my life, how He loved me, how He had forgiven me, how He is for me. God has, uh, God is with me, just the presence and the power of God. I couldn't have put words to it. I'd never heard of the Holy Spirit before. I never knew you could experience the presence of God. I hadn't heard about Moses and the burning bush. The Bible was so foreign, I had no concept, but yet I met with the presence of God and God showed me without the download of the teaching that I could give you today as a 14 year old God showed me what it was to be made in the image and the likeness of God and my prayer is that you would experience the same today if you're in the room would you stand to your feet if you're online would you open your heart in this place and what I'd love to do before we go a step further is to invite you, if you don't know Jesus, into a relationship with Him. With every eye closed and every heart open and every Christian just quietly praying in this moment, I want to put this question to you. This isn't a question of judgment or condemnation. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's a question of grace. It's a question of, do you know the saving power of Jesus Christ? Have you given your heart to Him? John 3.16, the most famous Bible verse of all. For God so loved the world. Make it personal. For God so loved you that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. This isn't a question about are you going to do some things to improve your life today? Can you take some good steps? Can you reset some New Year's resolutions and perform better today? No. No, this is are you willing to receive and accept the gift of grace that Jesus paid for your sins and wants to give you a new hope and a new future. And with every eye closed, every heart open, and just myself and a couple of trusted team looking out. If you know that your heart isn't right with Jesus, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer after this, a simple prayer of saying, Jesus, I receive the promise of your grace, of your forgiveness. Right now, who's that person? Who's that person? Maybe you're a young person you like me as a 14-year-old. The beginning of life, looking at your future and saying, I don't want to do this alone. Or maybe you've weathered some of life's storms and you're saying, I, I don't want to go another step forward. I know what it's like to live without Jesus as my firm foundation. But today I want to know Him. Maybe you're online today and God's speaking to you. Then I'm going to ask you, just to respond in your own way. God, I believe. Lord, I believe. Who's here in the room? Would you just raise your hand nice and high? Today is a day where you're saying, Jesus, be my Savior and be my Lord. Is that you, young person, older person? I don't mind lingering. I just want to give every person an opportunity to know Him. Come on, that's so good. Let's pray together. Would you repeat this prayer after me? Jesus, I believe. You died for me. It was for the joy set before you that you endured the cross. I believe you saw me. And the joy of me knowing you brought you hope and joy to endure the cross. I give you my life. I give you my future. I surrender my past. I'm a new creation. Because you say so. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, in this time as the team lead us in this song, I would just love to finish with an invitation. I really feel today that there are people here that are like that Lego build. And you might feel like there have been some things that are missing. And you're hearing this message about the image of God and saying, God, I'm missing pieces. God, I've, I've got pieces added to me. I just don't feel like I've got what it takes. And it's a human problem. It's a human issue. But I really sense today that God is wanting to take your life and He is wanting to build strength today. He's wanting to put the pieces together. And I really believe that as we pray today, I'm going to invite you to come to the farm. We're going to pray for you. As we pray today that God is going to reposition the Lego pieces of your heart. 
and he's going to add strength and he is going to add stability. I sense God saying, I'm going to recreate the image of God to know what it is to be a son, to be a daughter. And if that's you today and you just know that God needs to do some repositioning, some reworking in your life, there's an anointing for that. There's also someone here and you're wrestling because you don't believe that you belong in the family of God. And I almost feel that this person has not just become new to faith. It may be you too, but there's someone here and you've actually been a Christian for a long time and you've been wrestling saying, I don't belong. I don't belong. I don't belong. And, and you're going, this is crazy. Why am I questioning my salvation? Why am I questioning if I belong to God? But God's here and He sees you. And it's not about your title and it's not about the longevity of your Christian walk. He sees you as a daughter. He sees you as a son. And today, if you just know that you need to surrender afresh to Him and say, God, would you turn the question marks into exclamation marks? I would love to pray for you as well. And I really believe that God is wanting to build strength and take out the question marks and build strength. And lastly, if you're wrestling with your identity, wrestling with some things that you go, I don't know if this is me or if this is God. I can't see with clarity what's true and what's not. And you feel like you're in a state of confusion. That's it. A state of confusion feels like your head's in a fog. Maybe it's about the future. Maybe it's about your identity, but your head's in a fog. I really sense today there is a grace to bring clarity and to bring vision. And so would you come and respond as the team lead us in this song?